Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Bradley Thompson here, and we are back with another episode of the Living the Canadian Dream podcast. We are here today, audio only, because today's interview is going to be a Skype interview, um, so it's only audio, so don't worry if you do not see me, if you're watching the YouTube video. Um, but before we start today's episode, uh, I want to talk about who this person is, how we connected, and why they are on the podcast. So for episode 42, I, you know, we were approaching November and I wanted to have on somebody who has, you know, a really good message for the month of November, November being Remembrance Day. Remembrance Day is something that, you know, a lot of people take for granted. It's just a day in the year. And a lot of people don't really get impacted by the day because they're so busy with their regular life. So what I wanted to do is on this platform, have somebody who is making an impact and doing something memorable in the world of highlighting the things that have happened and the people that fought for our freedom. So I found this person online um, through an article in the news and I watched his trailer. He is a filmmaker and he is currently making a documentary called Last One Standing. This individual's name is Eric Brunt and he has spent over a year traveling across Canada in a van, going from city to city, interviewing over 400 Canadian war, World War II veterans. Absolutely incredible. He sat down with these individuals, he ate lunch with them, which you're going to find out, and he had real conversations and found out their story. He was inspired by his grandfather, who was in the war, and some of the stories that he has to tell are just absolutely incredible, and they will change your perspective. And I think this episode is very important, especially for Remembrance Day, because it's something that a lot of us take for granted. You know, especially my generation, the generations after the war, we never had to experience the things that these World War II veterans had to experience. You know, people nowadays in my world are complaining over Instagram posts, complaining and getting offended over Facebook posts that don't matter at all. These are first world problems. These are things that only we can experience because we don't have the problems that the individuals before us had. You know, we don't experience war on our home soil. We don't experience famine like a lot of countries do still. We don't experience constant survival. We're very lucky. We have freedom. We have opportunities in this country because of those who fought for our freedom. The World War II veterans, often that you do not hear about, the Canadian World War II veterans. And that's why this conversation is so important. That's why Eric's documentary is so important. Because a lot of times in the world of Remembrance Day and hearing about World War II, you don't often hear about the Canadian veterans. We live so close to the, U the USA, that you hear about the American veterans, you hear about American war stories, and you get that from obviously Hollywood, from the media, all that sort of stuff. But something that we don't regularly hear is from our own veterans. The veterans that were on our home soil, the veterans that fought for Canada and gave Canada the freedom that we have today. So that's why this episode is so important. So what I want you to do is please listen to this episode, but not only listen to this episode, please follow Eric Brunt's journey. He has a website. You can follow it at ericbruntmedia.com. That is E-R-I-C-B-R-U-N-T-M-E-D-I-A.com. This will give you all of the information about his documentary, but also it'll give you information about what he's doing now, 
where he is it at in the um, film editing process and when the film's going to come out. Um, you can also donate by going to this website. If you can, if you have the money to donate, please donate to support this film because it deserves to be heard. There are so many people, grandparents of individuals, you know, great grandparents of some individuals, great great grandparents of some individuals that have fought in the war and fought for our freedom. So please support this move, uh, this documentary. If you cannot donate, if you have connections in the film industry, make sure you hit up Eric Brunt because he deserves the support because he is doing incredible work right now. He is highlighting incredible individuals that are willing to share their story. So please do that. If you do not have connections, if you don't have the money to support, that's okay. Please share his information so the rest of the world can see. He's posted trailers. He's posted short interviews that are going to be highlighted in the overall film. So whatever you can do to support, make sure you support this awesome campaign because as a Canadian, as somebody that's living in Canada, these are the stories that really deserve to be heard. On a regular basis, we're hearing stories about Kim Kardashian, the latest drama online. These are the stories that really matter, okay? We don't need to hear about the latest Nikes or Supreme gear. These are the stories that really matter when it comes to our lives and our history. So please support. Other than that, without further ado, we're going to hop into this episode. Um, it's a very good episode. I'm really happy I was able to sit down and connect with Eric. Um, he's met a lot of awesome individuals and he highlights a few of them in here and then summarizes what the whole point of the project was and what he learned throughout the process. So without further ado, here is episode 42 of the Living the Canadian Dream podcast. One of the reasons I'm able to call it the Living the Canadian Dream podcast because we are able to live our dreams in Canada. It's corny, but it's true. So without further ado, here is episode 42 of the Living the Canadian Dream podcast with Eric Brunt, the filmmaker for the documentary coming out soon next year. Last one standing. The Canadian dream. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy Bradley Thompson here, and we are back with another episode of the Living the Canadian Dream podcast. Um, today, we got a special interview via Skype. Once again, my favorite video audio platform that always crashes skype um, <laughs> um today i'm joined here with a special guest somebody that i kind of found online um he is on the other side of the country his name is eric brunt um welcome eric thank you for having me on the show brad yeah no worries um so i'll tell you sort of what eric is about just on a vague scale why i found him online um, and then we'll go into it, okay? So basically, I was sort of online. I came across a documentary, um, a trailer, and it was The Last One Standing. And I shot you a message, and we just connected super quick. And this was like, what, was it like a week ago or two weeks yeah, ago? It was like super that. quick. So yeah, it, it was really cool. I could, it was, um, you were in a news article. I think it was Vancouver Sun or something. I don't remember yeah. which one it was. That was yeah. sent for last week for sure. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I came across and I looked up your uh, doc and stuff like that. I'm just like, oh, I definitely want to have you on, mm -hmm. especially because it's November and Remembrance Day. Certainly. And it's just great to sort of touch on the stuff that you touch in your documentary. So if you can introduce yourselves for everybody, um, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. So my name's Eric Brunt. I am indeed on the other side of Canada. I'm in Victoria, BC. So Awesome. Almost about as west as you can get. Yeah. And I went to film school at UBC in Vancouver. And I was at 
school when my uh, grandfather passed away and he was a World War II veteran. And that made me realize, um, I guess, just how little I did know about his service. Um, I knew that he served in Canada. I knew that he spent five years doing that. I didn't know mm. a, a ton about what exactly he did. And it kind of made me wish that I did know that. And I had asked those questions while he was still living. Yeah, so yeah. it kind of inspired me to reach out to some local veterans in the Vancouver area and make a short film. And that short film was actually called uh, Last Men Standing. And it was eight uh, Second World War veterans in Vancouver. And I kind mm. of did that for a class, actually, and fell in love with the whole process of the documentary filmmaking and hearing from these these pretty awesome guys and it made me think that well this is just vancouver i wonder what else is out there in bc and even greater the whole rest of canada so it was sort of a this idea that was sitting in my head for a long time and i tried to get some funding for it but unfortunately couldn't wrestle anything up so i saved up my own money got uh got a van and uh, took off across the country for a little over a year trying to interview as many veterans as i could that's so cool, man. That's like, yeah. honestly, thank you for doing this because this is such a cool thing, but also something that needs to be done for sure, especially for Canadian veterans. Like you never hear about the stories, all of these people that, you know, fought for our freedom mm-hmm. and it's just an amazing thing that you're doing. And I, and that's why I wanted you on. You're just like, not yeah, only yeah. are you a great filmmaker, I've already seen like obviously a bunch of your trailers and uh, short clips and stuff like that, which are Thanks great um but just the whole theme behind it is just a fantastic um it's just a fantastic piece to touch on so why did you um so so you did it in um so you started it when you were at school yeah and you highlighted eight people yeah who were those eight people did your grandfather know those eight people uh those other people uh um, the, yeah sorry just um the, yes the eight people were uh, simply, basically what happened was, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's uh, Royal Canadian Legions in every city and every town. There's, yep. um, gosh, there's probably like over 500, if not more. And basically, I just cold called or cold emailed okay. every Legion in Vancouver and Victoria, for that matter, and was like, hey, I was, gosh, I think I was 22 at the time. Okay. Uh, this is a little while. This is this would have been in 2015. Okay. And I said, hey, I'm... Uh, We'll do this documentary. Do you have anybody who would be interested in talking to me? And uh, sure enough, eight people, eight men um, appeared across uh, the Vancouver and Victoria area. And they just, uh, back then I was on the bus. So I just took my camera equipment on the bus and uh, went to interview them. That's awesome. Um, for anybody that doesn't know what the Royal Canadian Legion is, can you explain briefly what that is? Yeah, certainly. So it's basically a, a, a a place that was set up after the first world war for veterans to get together and um, socialize and also for uh, fundraisers to be put on to uh, generate money for veterans and the events that they want to put on. So basically awesome. they're a staple of every small town and they kind of uh, there's a number of them in, in cities as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause you definitely hear about the name, but you know, ne- like, you know, you never really taught that in school. Like, Oh, this is what this, you know, group. Totally. Of- people do so like people might not know what that is but that that's awesome so you met these eight individuals and then you just sat down with them you brought your camera yeah um microphone and 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 then just interviewed them yeah and it was kind of it was kind of crazy for me because i would never really done anything where you're completely welcome into a stranger's home and you sit down with them and get to know them for a while and i mean you think that maybe these interviews are going to be short, but you end up spending two, three hours with these people and really hearing about what they went through and uh, kind of uncovering the other story. I kind of like, I I like to kind of make the comparison. You're kind of peeling back the layers and Mm -hmm. sometimes it takes a few hours to do that. And then once you get to the, uh, the end, sometimes you have some incredible stories. And so I kind of was blown away by that and how I was just a stranger and I was, uh, they were kind of living me into their world. And I think, the reason they were letting me into their world is one, uh, because I was around the age that they probably would have been during the war. Uh, yeah, for sure. Two, yeah. that my grandpa was a veteran, so I kind of had that personal connection. Yeah. And I think I think maybe three is that the fact that I'm an outsider, um, interested in their stories. Uh, they didn't really have to. I think some people they want to protect their families and not maybe 
say things that might hurt them. So mm-hmm. by going into some of these darker stories, they were me being a stranger, they were able to sort of just open up and talk about those things. So yeah, I think those three things kind of allowed that experience to happen. And that was sort of what pushed me to want to do more. That's that's really cool. Um, so when you when you sit sit down with these individuals, um, you say they're hours long. So like how often, like how long would you stay at somebody's house for, like to sort of yeah. talk to them and stuff like that? So I, I I'd say that um, I'd say the average length would be an hour, but still there have been many that have gone. I think my longest one was like eight hours long. It was wow. Crazy. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, basically you, what happens is. I was just walking through it. So I yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I got their address from either a family member or themselves. I go to their house. I knock on the door. They let me in. Uh, we make small talk for a little bit. I try mm-hmm. and make them as comfortable as possible. And then I ask uh, if I can set my camera up. And they almost always say yes. And then uh, get the camera set up. And that's when we really dive into the interview. And I mean, sometimes we go, we have to go over time, over lunch or over dinner. And so mm-hmm. afterwards, we sometimes uh, will grab a bite to eat after after and it's always so funny because like they're they're like just for an example this one veteran said like i gotta take you to my favorite restaurant afterwards i was like (laughs) okay uh, i'm into it and he's like uh it's like it has the best burgers ever and you're gonna love it i'm like okay okay this is awesome so that interview was probably five hours we go to get we jump in the car (laughs) he's he drives he's like 95 (laughs) And we go oh, and it's man. uh it's Harvey's is his it's his favorite spot. So we're sitting in Harvey's and he's like, This place is great, you're gonna make your own burger and <laughs> get any toppings you want. And like, yeah, oh, that is actually goodness. pretty great. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm into it. So uh That's that was so just funny. Yeah, so that's just an example of how one day can go. But I mean it was it's awesome and you can't you leave there with uh feeling like, like you've made a new friend. Yeah, that that's really cool. Um do you still keep in touch with some of the people that you originally started uh interviewing? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's, and that's awesome. Cool because um, I find that uh, their family members will also reach out af- after a while, whether that's they great. just heard about me or, or no matter what. Um, and I always tell the veterans themselves that I can give them my phone number and say, hey, if you want to if you want to um, talk like I'm always in. So just yeah, the, just last weekend, I was on the phone with a veteran from Thunder Bay that I interviewed for about half an hour. And he was just telling me how things were in Thunder Bay and just a way to catch up and uh yeah I, I love it like I love talking to these people and if I can help them make a feel a little, maybe a little less lonely on a, a weekend then I'm always there so I love catching up with them and I don't I don't like to think that I was just kind of in their life and out of it like I, I, I yeah, very yeah. Much, I'm happy when they they want to keep me in their life and keep in contact that's that's a real rewarding part of it yeah yeah that's really good and then then they know like they have a connection and mm-hmm. this person's going to tell their story totally the proper way which is mm-hmm. great. Um, that's that's really cool. So you did this initial school documentary, and then you sort of started getting into it a little bit more, and you sort of wanted to expand. Is that sort of how yeah. it developed? And kind of it was a bit put on hold because uh, I graduated university in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, so a year, a year after I made that short, and then I had to uh, basically had bills to pay, had bills to pay, mm-hmm. and had to work. So kind of entered the. Uh, in the workforce in Vancouver, but it was always on the top of my head. I was like, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, because it was just a passion of mine. And my friends were, were like, you gotta just do it. And I said, okay, I will. And so then, uh, I guess two years later, in uh, early 2018, I was like, I'm just gonna do it. And that's when I uh, quit my job, uh, moved out of the house I was living in, got the van, and uh, took off across Canada. That's that's awesome. That, yeah. that's that's a big plunge that's that's oh, a really sure. big plunge people thought people still think i'm crazy but people thought i was crazy then for sure <laughs> yeah yeah because it's it's uh obviously it's risky because you're following a passion mm-hmm. um and it's it's one of those things whenever it's something creative people already think it's a risk even though you know it's not necessarily a risk you have a yeah. you have a project um yeah. but yeah just to leave everything behind to sort of just work on one thing that's uh yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy story. It's really cool though. Um how long did it take you to get ready to sort of move out of, you know, everything? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh I'm trying to think of when I exactly decided, but I think it was probably around um I want to say like January. I was like, okay, it's like I'm going to I'm not going to be here in the summer because it, it was originally going to be just a 4-month trip. So I was like, okay, okay. I'm going to I'm going to leave 
I'm going to move out of my house, out of the house I'm living in, uh, beginning of May, and then I'm going to um, start the trip and be done by September. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had a bit of money already saved up, but I actually quit my job around then and was working as just like a freelance videographer, um, okay. picking up projects here and there, getting some more money in. And I was also doing a few interviews on the side that, of people I uh, hadn't gotten yet in Vancouver because I thought if I'm already here, I might as well do them. So just kind of warming yeah, up. Sure. And then May was when I took the plunge and uh, gave up my lease and then started. Well, I guess I haven't mentioned it yet, but uh, for the big majority of the trip, I was actually uh, camping out of my van. So that was my accommodation as well as my workspace. Awesome. Um, as well as my transportation to keep yeah. costs down low. For so sure. that's when I started, yeah, camping out of the van and, and slowly making my way across Canada. And sure enough, after four months that we're over, I think I just hit uh, Thunder Bay. So I still had like all of Ontario to go and then Quebec in the maritime. So I, that's when I right. realized I'm going to need one more time to more money. And so that's when I started a, a GoFundMe campaign up. And that's what let, allowed me to keep going until uh, June of this year. Sure. Awesome. That, that is an awesome story. Um, so how was camping outdoors? Let's, let's hit that first. <laughs> yeah. How was that? How was camping across Canada? So it was, uh, it was really good for the most part. I'm not like a, I'm not a camper. So at first I was like, this is going to be not good, but it, it mm -hmm. was fine. Um, and I was able to stay at like friends places across Canada as well, just for people I've met at UBC, um, awesome. which is great. And then it wasn't, it was starting to get cold in, I'd say November. And then my last my last night camping in the van was January 3rd and it got, it was just like, I remember being negative 13 in Toronto. That's crazy. And I yeah, was like, yeah. this, is, this is too much. And then yeah. I, I started um, just staying at Airbnb. So just like a room, at, usually like a room in someone's house. For sure. Um, and that's what I did for the rest of the trip. But yeah, I was in the van, I guess, from May till January, which was kind of crazy. But you got used to it really quickly and I it was converted. So it had like a bed in the back that could also okay. be used as a, Excuse me, that could also be used as a, a couch that I could just like sit on and edit. Awesome. So it was super multi purpose. And yeah, it was actually, yeah, I was surprisingly fine. Like I'm not a camper and I was able to do it. That's awesome. So, in terms of amenities, did you do it like in a camping style? Like for water, do you go to campsites? And yeah. Stuff like, that? like for cooking, you go to campsites and make a fire? Like how did it, how did yeah. it work? Yeah. So, um, I, I would, yeah, so sometimes I'd stay at campsites, but sometimes it's like you're in the middle of nowhere and, uh, or even if you're in the city, I feel like it's really hard to find affordable campgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I would just kind of like, I would just park on the side of the street in some residential area and just, that'd be the spot for the night. So I'd have yeah, to, yeah. I'd have to go, I guess, usually go out for dinner that night or just get something where I could, uh, easily make without any stove. But other than that, um, I'd go, I, I'd go the camping route. Yeah, yeah. And then as it got colder, um, the campgrounds closed down. So I just had to, uh, yeah, just camp on the, by like a field or um, in the residential area and just, yeah, to hope for the best, save a lot of money that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I can imagine. That's um, really rough in it for sure, especially if yeah. you don't have water and stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah that's... 100%. Well, yeah. Always, always had, well, I always made sure I had like a big uh, water jugs if I ever yeah. needed water. Uh, but that was another thing because th as it got colder the water started to freeze so oh, uh, yeah. that's when that's when I kind of laid down the I guess threw the towel into the rink so to speak and was like hey this is, can't be keep happening but um but yeah so I'd always have water always have food so it wasn't like I was all it wasn't like I was um it wasn't like too it wasn't too hard like I've I've traveled a bit in my life and it wasn't like too hardcore traveling but mm -hmm. um yeah it was surprisingly easy that's that's really cool yeah because like um there's like a few rock climbers I follow. I don't know if you ever watched the movie Free Solo. The, oh yeah, it's amazing. But Alex Honnold, yeah, yeah, where he lives out of his van, and he's got like a stove and stuff. It's, it's yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, that's the first time I really saw the saw inside that. of like the camp van life. So that's that's really cool that you did so, that. Yeah, it, it it is very much like that, except his is definitely nicer. And yeah, he is a he is a stove. But seeing that movie, you definitely get a glimpse of what my uh, life was like for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really cool. So. When you're traveling across Canada, what sort of cities are you hitting or towns? Like, did you decide you're going to interview these people first and then set up the interview and then drive there? Like, how did it work? So basically, it was 
uh, going back to the legions again. So I'd I'd find every literally I'd try and find every branch of the legion I could in a province, and then I'd um, contact them and let's say, okay, let's choose a random one. Like let's say Red Deer. Uh, they said, oh, we've got two Second World War veterans here. Mm-hmm. Do they want to talk to me? Yes, they do. So that means Red Deer's on the map all of a sudden. So oh, basically, okay, cool. I, I'd, go, I'd go wherever um, I could find the veterans, and I'd stay for however long as I could. So, like, for example, Winnipeg randomly was a gold mine of, of veterans. So I ended up, I was like, oh, I'll probably be in Winnipeg for, like, three or four days. But I ended up staying there almost, I think, almost three weeks because I was finding so many in Winnipeg. Um, mm. So the trip was totally dictated by that. And as the as word of the trip grew, uh, mm-hmm. I started getting a bit of news coverage. Then I would have people reaching out to me. So it wasn't so much me making the uh, reaching out to the legions. And then when that That's started happening, idea. yeah. So that, that started happening. That also helped me plan the trip out a bit more because I knew I knew that, okay, there's this guy in this town in Quebec that I'm going to want to visit at, at one point. And that really helped me map, map it out more. But uh yeah, it was kind of a. I should draw out the the lot the trip that I did because it's it's kind of zigzagging all over the country. Yeah, you does should. Not yeah, make, does not make any sense uh, economically how I did it, but it just was the way I had to kind of go about things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Did you get any like referrals from individuals, like say, like they knew other people? Yeah, for sure. And there was um, somewhere, uh, like for example, on a plane. If you're in the Air Force and you're on a plane, there was usually seven of you. And mm-hmm. sometimes there'd be like another guy from that crew that was still living. And they'd okay. be like, oh, when you get to like Peterborough, you should interview him. And that's or awesome. They, yeah. or, they'd, or they'd be like siblings or, yeah, a lot of referrals from the veterans themselves. And that was awesome because that meant that they you kind of had a, an in. Like a lot of the time with the legions, they'd just give you their phone number and you'd have to kind of explain yourself over the phone. But yeah, if you yeah. had like a, a family member or a friend make the connection yeah, lead, for you, yeah. then yeah. as soon as you call them, they're like, all right, when are you coming over? And, and you didn't have to like a, make a small pitch right away so that made things easier for sure that's really cool so have you gone all the way across canada yet like yeah did you yeah you're sort of done totally so, the trip? yeah yeah so i got to um so yeah left victoria in may and then i got to st john's newfoundland in april and then mm-hmm. uh i got back to victoria i guess i got back to yeah i got back to victoria in june okay and to top that off uh, I got back, and then two days later, I, I flew to France for the 75th anniversary of D-Day, which was crazy. And then I came yeah. back, and then I'm, wow. I'm done. I'm wow. just editing now. Wow. So, okay. So, how many interviews in total did you do throughout the entire trip? Because that's, yeah. that's a crazy trip. That's a super long time. Yeah. A lot of hours. Yeah. So, I did just over 400. Wow. That's so almost, crazy. Almost, wow. Almost one a day. Wow, that's that's amazing though. That's yeah. incredible. A lot of a lot of uh, interesting stories and interesting people. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess you've met people from all different backgrounds, all different parts of the army and yeah. military. Like, what are the different areas that you sort of met people in and interviewed? Like in terms of the military? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. just in terms, yeah. Yeah. So basically, the big ones are um, you got yeah you got your army, you got your. Uh, your air force, you got your mm-hmm. navy, uh, and then there's the, the merchant navy, which is, it's kind of like a, a regular person wouldn't know it, but there's technically a navy and a merchant navy, and they're two separate things. Uh, so those okay. are the four groups for the guys, and then there's the woman who fought. So there's that category, um, mm-hmm. and then you have the category of people who went uh, overseas or people who stayed and either defended our coasts or trained people, like my grandpa did, and stayed in Canada. So there's it's crazy because I think that when people think of World War II, they think of like uh, I think usually army. Like I think usually they think of Saving Private Ryan and like yeah, I don't yeah. Know, like, what you usually think what you usually think of. But I like I infantry think, and stuff. Totally yeah. like marching yeah. and like front lines, like that sort yeah. of stuff. But that's that's really a like a small part of it. Like there's mm-hmm. so much uh, there's so many cogs to the machine that um, that that cog for whatever reason gets the most attention. But there's yeah there's so many interesting different parts and so. That was a big part of it, was trying to make sure everyone was being represented. And so when the documentary does come out, people not being like, oh, there's nobody from the Merchant Navy or there's no mm-hmm. woman in it. Then I, I yeah, so that's the, the title changed because the title is going to be Last Men Standing. But it soon became very apparent that there's uh, there, there were thousands of Canadian women who served. So then it became Last One Standing. 
Yeah, that, that's that. really good. Yeah, yeah. But then that way you're covering all bases, which is great because you're getting all these different perspectives and all these different stories in different areas of the military mm -hmm. or just at different time periods. Um, did you find a lot of the people were... Did, did you interview anybody before World War II, after World War II? Like, about the, about everybody... those experiences? Yeah, like what was it sort of like basically everybody serving throughout World War II for like periods of time? Yeah, so basically... If that well, question makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. Basically, yeah. The, the only prerequisite to talk to doing the interview is that mm -hmm. you had to serve in the military and World War II at some time. So okay. that, that kind of exited out... Um, wives and children and just because they won those first 10 experiences of course yeah um and then from i'm losing my train of thought here so then from what was the question again now you, <laughs> yeah yeah so so did you have anybody that like like say maybe oh, yeah, served yeah. before them like world war ii started saying. or like yeah, I see what right after yeah 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 so there so yeah so there were a lot of people who uh after they were in the military it kind of became their uh, their life passion and they continued to stay in the military. They maybe fought in the Korean war, which is something that doesn't get talked about, but yeah, just, yeah. just for the scope of my project, um, I just kept it to their military, their military service in world war two. Mm -hmm. But within that, um, I always asked the veterans about their childhood and their upbringing because okay. I thought that had, that played a big, um, growing up in the depression, I think had a big, uh, effect on them and were made them, allowed them to, become the people they were in the war. Uh, so okay. that was a big focus of the interview. And then I also talked about what it was like and how they were treated when they came back to Canada, because I thought that was a interesting part of it all. So that was- Yeah, that's definitely an interesting topic, yeah. Yeah, so th so as, as these people have lived 90 years of life, like they could probably write whole books on their life, but that, that was the focus was what made them who they were, the war years, and then just after the war years so i could there were there were military experiences outside of that but that was the, basically the focus the focus okay yeah because i was wondering i'm just like because i'm sure some people you know probably served before world war ii or served after yeah. world war ii so i wasn't sure. sure like yeah what what the sort of um if you cover that stuff but yeah. that's really cool so in terms of veterans and stuff like that um what were some of the most shocking stories or things that you heard throughout your interviews yeah so one that i just I, that just popped up in my memory the other day is um so kind of touching back on the woman so i mm -hmm. think that there's a lot of like for example women weren't on the front lines they weren't in the the typical army roles that you you see but yeah world, world war ii really it really opened up all these new career uh, path for for women as a result of of a war being declared. So before the war, the the teaching professions that were available as a woman, I think, were uh, limited to basically a nurse, a secretary, uh, secretary, mm -hmm. or a, a teacher. Those were like your three your three career choices, or you got married and started having a family. Yeah. But World War II marked the first time that uh, the military was open outside of nursing to to women. So all of a sudden you had women truck yeah. drivers, you had women pilots, you had women uh, working in radar, you had women uh, doing, yeah, all, all sorts of different things. Yeah, because they need the help and stuff, yeah. Totally, and they need yeah. they needed all hands on deck, and so they needed to free up roles that men previously had that they could now be turned to the woman. So one of these roles that was I found um, especially kind of interesting is, and I knew nothing about this before, but basically... Um, I'll try not to get too technical here, but there's this system mm -hmm. called uh, Lon Lonar, L-O-N-A-R. And what okay. this system allowed was ships along the coast of North America to maintain radio silence so they could okay. talk They could talk among each other, but the, the Germans couldn't intercept these messages, which was mm -hmm. they were trying to do all the time. So to operate these, to, for Lonar to exist, there had to be these stations set up where the machines would be monitored. Mm -hmm. So one of these stations was off the coast of uh, Nova Scotia, close to Yarmouth, if you know where that area is at all. Um, and basically, 25 women were assigned to man this lonar machine and make sure it was always running. And if any, if for any chance the Germans landed in Canada, they, mm -hmm. were, they were explicitly told, 
to light the, there was dynamite underneath this machine and they were told to light this dynamite and wow. run because wow. this technology could not get into the Germans' hands under any circumstances. Yeah. And, and so out of these 25 women, two are still living. So I was able to track both of them down and got to hear their stories. And it's like this just totally crazy. Des- desolate uh, area. It's not even a town where they had to live. And they like the way they they, t- they talk about it, like uh, like you're really on the edge of the world. And they even told me one night there was a there was a U-boat sighting because there were U-boats in that that were off spot off the coast of Canada. Mm-hmm. And there were actually two that were spotted this one evening. And so they're all sort of uh, it's funny because I got to hear it from both from two, two different people who were there. But they both were saying how they're kind of wondering, OK, like. <laughs> are we are we going to like these are we getting ready to like these explosives and are we wow. going to be ready to ride and I, I asked one of them I said well like take me through what would you have done the Germans yeah. land and they'd take a step out and she said okay we would have we would have lit the dynamite we would have run we all had guns so we would yeah. have stood our ground and being prepared to fight if we had to and fire our guns and I said you would have been prepared to pull that trigger and fire at them and he says yep I, w- I would have done it so it was just yeah. hearing that these women were and they're in their 90s now of course but as sure. young girls 1920 they're ready to like defend and their country just like that and it's crazy uh, yeah it's just a, a crazy uh, thing to wrap your head around but that was the woman and they weren't on the front lines but in a way they were right there if need be they would they would have stepped up to the plate that's that's so awesome like and these are like the things you don't hear about especially like you know our oh. ages our generation you know we're so far removed from world war ii Yes. And we never had to experience any of those problems, any of the famine, any of the war on home soil or any of that stuff. We're very fortunate. Very. Um, just our generation alone, but also, you know, just as a country, like for these veterans to fight for our freedom. It's just such an awesome oh. like it's just such a fortunate thing. We're so lucky to be living in this country. And yeah. um, it just every time like. <laughs> Like, especially always when November comes around, because Remembrance Day, it makes you remember, which is the whole point of it. Mm -hmm. But just even when people, you know, have Twitter feuds, have stuff on social media that they're complaining Mm -hmm. about, like, oh, that's offensive or any of that stuff. And it's just you stop and think about, like, we're so lucky here. Um, Yeah. Just because, (laughs) yeah, like, these are first world problems that, you know, the generations before us would have never had because yeah. we just don't have problems like like they, they did, did <laughs> you know back in the day so yeah like to, just to hear that story alone it just gives you some perspective like mm-hmm. you know individuals willing to fight or willing to sacrifice themselves for, for canada the, yeah for for people that they don't even know and meanwhile you know our generation is you know, watching memes and <laughs> yeah, all that sort of stuff. It just it just blows my mind. It really gives you perspective. So totally, it's interesting to compare, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it just it just blows my mind. And like even watching some of your little uh, shorter interviews that you had on like online and stuff. It just yeah, just hearing what they had to say about their um their journey throughout the war. It just mm. it just really gives you perspective on on life. Totally. And then. Yeah. So, it, so uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Even, yeah. I was just gonna say things you can't even comprehend in in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just it's a totally different thing. It's just it's so especially when you're asking questions like how were you treated when you got back? It's just those are important questions to ask because mm-hmm. you know you hear the stories where you know veterans aren't treated the way that they should be because mm-hmm. you know even if they didn't get a medal. They're all war heroes because they all contributed to, you know, our freedom, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it just, you know, I, I hope, you know, in this country that they're getting the treatment that they deserve um, mm-hmm. for their contribution. But um, it's it's really cool to hear, um, especially that story, uh, because it really gives you perspective and totally. a story that you never hear uh, in Hollywood or. And that was know, kind of the the motivating yeah. the motivating. Some of the motivating force was hearing these kind of uh, not very well-known stories and kind of being able to, I mean, the, for the whole trip, I was, I had a Facebook page and a, uh, Instagram and I was posting and just hearing some of the feedback about how they never even knew that 
Canadians did that or ever even mm-hmm. imagined that was part of a war. Um, it was the same reaction I had, but it was just awesome to kind of get confirmation that these were kind of hidden stories that weren't seeing the light of day and being able to be, I guess, somewhat of a, a platform for these stories to be shared was, um, and still is a, a, a very humbling experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of people don't really um, realize the impact that Canada had on World yeah. War II, which no, is all. another thing. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you really get the perspective from America because, you know, from the States, because Flight we're so waving. close. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and because of obviously the media. But, you know, to hear the perspective of Canadian World War II veterans and to find out what they actually did, because you do hear the odd story about, like, Vimy Ridge and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, but you don't hear the stuff like on the home front and all well, that other stuff. Well, also, I think, and this was what really brought back, brought home to me at the end of the trip is I mentioned it before, but I went to uh, France for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And yeah. um, so there were five beaches uh, uh, at D-Day that the Allied forces um, invaded. And Canada actually had their own beach called Juno Beach, which I think most yeah. people know about. Yeah. But basically... Um, there were, so the Canadian government brought over, I think it was 37, I might have the number wrong, but 37 Second World War Canadian veterans, and they were there on Juneau Beach for the 75th anniversary. And just um, seeing that these specifically Canadian veterans were there, and you see how big the beach is, and you imagine how many more there were that day, it's yeah. incredible. And just knowing that that was the Canadian contribution, um, not putting anything short of the Americans or the British, but we definitely... And I think it's part of our nature is we definitely don't boast about um, what we did accomplish. But uh, some of the, I mean, the area that was taken from the, Can- the area that was captured by the Canadians was some of the first, uh, fr- first freed French land um, yeah. ever. And it's uh, incredible to think that we had a huge role in, I guess, in a way, saving the world. Yeah, for sure. And what a lot of people, I think, don't realize is that if Canada didn't contribute the way that they did, Mm-hmm. it would have came back to North America. Mm-hmm. So, Certainly. you know, like, so those big movements were very important to the history of the world, as you just said. So that's, um, that's very, that's very interesting. Did you have any, um, I, I'm sure you had people on the home front and then in Europe as well. Um, yeah. In terms of I, veterans, like, certainly. what was that like? Yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, it was, like I was saying, it was important to get all the stories. Um, mm-hmm. For me, knowing that my grandpa was someone that was never interviewed because he was a home front veteran uh, inspired me to still want to talk to those where I think some people wouldn't have, but sure. got some really inter- interesting perspectives from that. But just as many I talked to, ones that went overseas to Europe, and even in that um, that con- contingency of 37 veterans I'd interviewed prior to the trip, already 22 of them. Wow. So it was kind of like seeing old friends, which was pretty, pretty cool. That's really cool, yeah. And then while I was there, I got to do a few more interviews, which was awesome. But um, yeah, and I think that um, it's good. It's interesting because I'm in the editing phase, so I'm kind of like figuring out where everything's being put together. Um, but they are such different experiences. But it is interesting because I think that even the ones that didn't see, so to speak, action still suffer from um, PTSD in the sense that they lost friends, they lost family members. Yeah. Um, sure. they, they were in, like, for example, let's say the two of us went to high school in Victoria, like your, our grad class would have been, all the boys would have probably joined up unless they had something, they were sick or they had to work on the farm or something. Like so many yeah. people in your, like it's so many people in your life were involved that you couldn't not know someone that died. Like there was just, like death was just so common. Um, yeah, yeah. Sure. So I think, I, like you, I'd be talking to some veterans who, so, yeah, didn't necessarily see the front lines, but just get as emotional, if not more emotional, talking about it because those are such uh, hard memories to think about losing people that that close to you. Yeah. And uh, that was surprising too, I think, because I think that maybe they don't get the same amount of, um, well, they don't have the same amount of medals or they don't get the same amount of yeah, maybe recognition respect. for sure. Exactly, yeah, recognition. Like I'm the first one who's ever interviewed them as opposed to some of these so to speak, war heroes who have not to say anything wrong of them, but they've told the story many times. Um, yeah. But finding the same emotion, if not maybe a more raw emotion that there's their voice hadn't been heard before and uh, getting to hear that was certainly uh, a really special experience. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, I don't know who I was 
there was a podcast that I listened to a long time ago. I don't know if it was a David Goggins or I don't know if you know David Goggins or Jocko Willenick, mm. but they're both like ex Navy SEALs. Okay. Um, but they talked about basically how, you know, for every um, lone survivor, like the movie Lone Survivor, there's yeah. thousands of them. Yeah. Which is, which is like, it makes sense. And you totally. don't hear from the other people because they're all affected or differently or they have PTSD or they just don't want to relive that. 100%. And yeah. So I, I, I'm guessing that that's sort of what you experienced as well, interviewing yeah. these individuals. And I, th- and I think also one thing that really came across was, um, excuse me, yeah, uh, nice. was, uh, what was, I think in this, in their generation, there's just such a overarching, um, selfishness mm-hmm. or self, sorry, not selfishness, selflessness. Yeah. Uh, because nobody boasts about what they did. They, it's like almost sometimes, uh, like pulling teeth to find out exactly what they did in the war because they didn't want to boast about their service and they it's always oh I'm yeah, not a hero yeah. yeah like I'm not a hero you should be talking to this guy like he's the he's the real hero or but then you hear what they did and it's like oh my gosh like I remember one veteran he's just casually explaining um one time he was in because he was uh, in the air force so one time w- during one of the flights and then just nonchalant like he's like yeah and then the uh, our wing got shut up, and before I knew it, I was I fell down to the ground and had to use my parachute. And then, wow. blah, 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 and just like carried on. And I was like, wait, 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 let's go back. What you were shot? You had to like parachute. Tell me more about that. I'm like, oh no, you don't want to hear about that. Like that was nothing. I was like, no, no, tell me more about that. Wow. Sure enough, like his plane had been hit, and he had to pull his parachute, and not his whole crew survived. And it was just like this crazy story that he was totally just going to pass over because he didn't think it was important. Yeah, that's. It's crazy, eh? Like, yeah. and it, it must be also not only because they're humble and they yeah. don't like want to sort of talk about their contribution, but I think it's also they've probably all seen so much stuff or experienced so many crazy things throughout their time at war, whether it's on the home front or yeah. whether it's abroad, yes. that it's just another event that happened. Totally. It's just, yeah, another another day, I guess, which is crazy to think. Whereas if that happened to one of us, it'd be like, the event that shaped our life. Yeah, yeah. Like we would have YouTube videos about it, just yeah, everything. Exactly. <laughs> like it, it's, it's, yeah. Literally, like it's 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 crazy. So um I also uh remember seeing you've interviewed a couple people that were prisoner of war. Yeah. How is that? Because yeah. that's something you don't even hear about a lot either, which is a common thing for yeah. war. Certainly. So, yeah, actually, surprisingly, quite a few prisoner of war. Um, so, but yeah, I, I feel like I remember one of the first interviews I did, actually, um, it was a, a, vet, a veteran here in BC, and I knew he'd been taken, well, I knew he was, he was involved in D-Day, and he had, uh, I knew he'd been taken to prisoner of war, and, uh, but the thing is, so we do the inter- we're doing the interview, and it turns out that it was only, I believe, two days after D-Day that he was taken prisoner. And I was, so that we're about 20 minutes into the interview, maybe, and I said, all right, well, then you're taken prisoner. What happened next? And he mm-hmm. totally just um, shut down and said, you know what, I can't talk about what happened in there. And it was kind of like this, I, I mean, that was the rest of his war, so it was kind of like walking on eggshells for the rest of the interview because... I didn't really yeah. know what else to ask because I was such the elephant in the room, so to speak. So I kind of had to talk about what his family was doing at the time and try not – because the last thing I wanted to do is upset him. And I never want to leave the veterans with a, yeah. a bad Flash impression. Flashbacks and the, stuff. Yeah, certainly. So uh, that was kind of a – I think that was probably my first prisoner of war I ever did. So I was that was kind of like a red flag to know that, okay, i got to be really careful when I'm doing those interviews. And I since then, I, I'm just throwing out kind of maybe a random number, but I'd say I've probably done about – 40 prisoners of war um, wow. over my time and they were it, it, it really much I'd say ranged in how what camp they were sent to in terms of what their treatment was like so mm-hmm. uh, the Air Force interestingly were very well respected by the Germans like to be in the German Air Force was like to be a god so to speak so mm. to so the Canadian Air Force men were treated quite well in prison camps because they were kind of respected as like the enemy gods I guess as mm-hmm. lack of a better words, the army ones had it worse. The navy had it worse, and then the absolute worst were uh, if you were taken prisoner by the Japanese uh, okay. because they, they didn't adhere to 
it was what was called the Geneva Convention. It was kind of like a yeah a, a code of how to treat your prisoners, and the Japanese uh, didn't adhere to that. So I had a number of veterans who were Japanese prisoners of war, and like the the malnutrition they suffered and the, the disease. It was like like after uh, some of those interviews, it's just like you have to make sure you don't do think about it too much because it can even weigh on you. Like kind of it's kind of a second degree like. PTSD, I guess, so to speak, like for sure. Some of these stories are so dark that it's like, oh my gosh. Like, for example, one interview I did in Newfoundland, uh, this veteran's ship was sunk. Um, yeah. It was he, he was taken prisoner by the Japanese, and he had a really good friend, and the, the two of them were like, kind of buddied up, and were like, let's get through this together. Like, this is we don't know when the war's going to end, but we're going to make it. And yeah. his buddy was like, his buddy was British, um, and mm -hmm. he was, and he was like. Uh, I think he was from Liverpool, and he says, "When I get, when you, if I don't make it, like I want you to go back to Liverpool, and I want you to um, see my wife and my daughter, and just tell them how much I love them, and that I try to make it, but I couldn't." And the veteran I interviewed promised him that he said, "Yeah, I'll do that." And mm -hmm. so uh, the British gentleman, he he passed away in the camp from, uh, I believe, malnutrition, and so it was just wow. this, it was just Lloyd left, and so he went to. He survived the he survived the camp. I think he was in there for like I want to say like three years, and he survived. Wow. He sure enough went to back to England to fulfill that promise. And oh, the that's amazing. Na the neighborhood that his buddy was from had been completely leveled during the war, and there the house wasn't standing, and the wife was the wife and the, the kid had passed away during those during those bomb raids. Oh and so, wow! And so literally, this entire family had just been wiped off the face of the earth and if it wasn't for someone like Lloyd telling me the story like their memory would be completely gone forever so that kind of hit home of how important it is to preserve these stories and pass them on because uh, I think it is so important to know names and to know little personal stories and like that little personal story of that family that's something that always kind of triggers me when I'm thinking about all the lives that were lost in the war and uh, how thankful we should be that, that that's not happening to us and we never have to do that for one of our friends. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. And a lot of them had to experience that stuff, like losing a yeah. friend. And I'm sure when you're talking to people, like they had, you know, friends that they talked about that probably yeah. were lost during the war. And boyfriends, girlfriends. Yeah. And kind of a, just a kind of, a, I feel like the, a reversal of the, so to speak, boyfriend passing away during war. I was interviewing one gentleman and um, he's from Toronto and he goes to, he goes over to overseas for his service. He's going to be in the army and he's really excited mm -hmm. and he has to say goodbye to his girlfriend and little does he know, but his girlfriend's, I guess, worried because he's a bit of a ladies man. And so she signs up for the Canadian woman's oh, army no way. And, and, and gets, gets accepted and she gets shipped overseas and she surprises him and he's been well behaved. And uh, so there's no problem there, but she surprises him at the barracks and, they end up getting they end up getting married and uh, uh, I believe it's three weeks later she dies in a bomb raid and no way wow. if, she hadn't, if she hadn't chased after him uh, that wouldn't have happened and that's just the kind of the reversal of what you normally think of and hearing him tell me that story it's like he's still getting choked up about it and it's like oh my gosh I, I'm like I can't believe you have to live through that and live with that like imagine the, the joy of just be like being reunited with her one marrying her second. And then being faced with like never ever seeing her again and still having to fight in the war. Like it just kind of blows my mind to ever have to be in the shoes of someone who had to experience that. Yeah, that's yeah. I couldn't even imagine. That's it's 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 war is a yeah is a horrible thing. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Um uh, to go back on the prisoner of war um stuff, just because yeah. like a lot of people don't know, and myself, I, I don't even know how it works. When yeah. the war ends, yeah. they're forced to release all prisoners. Correct? Is that how it works? Like, how does that? Yeah, it's act yeah they are, but it's it's kind of it's it's kind of messy because basically what happens is that like they don't want to be okay. So let's say for example you're in a German prison camp and the it looks like the either the Russians or the Canadians or the Americans or the British are going to be in your area soon. So usually the Germans just just leave. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden the prisoners find themselves, there's no guards. And so they're like, okay, so either they wait for 
the forces to eventually come where they go off into the woods and try and find them themselves and oh okay so it, it's kind of it's complete this it's disarray and uh yeah no order so it's you think it's not clean or tidy whatsoever it's kind of just like the enemy disappears and all of a sudden you're free like there's no there's no oh, like okay. signing there's no it's... signing of official papers or anything it's like just happens yeah yeah because that's not something you usually hear about like the transition of like how yeah. does one go from a prisoner like, being, yeah being a prisoner to being God. free yeah it's crazy isn't it yeah it's 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 a wild thing wow um in terms of your interviews and stuff was there anything that really changed your perspective on stuff like any any yeah. like quotes or like just any thing that you experienced throughout this process that really changed your perspective i think it like just sort of some of the stories i've been mentioning now like it sort of um changed my perspective on i guess two things one one is like uh what it means to be a Canadian, like how I've become so much more proud of to be Canadian and, um, excuse me, to have my Canadian flag and talk about if someone asked me what I am, like to say Canadian because I hear about of all course, these yeah. incredible Canadians and uh, what they went through. And it's like, yeah, like my grandparents did that. And like that generation of people who live in the same country did that. Like I, I should be proud of that. So that's been a big one. Uh, also just the, we we're talking about this a bit earlier, but just the mm -hmm. appreciation of the freedom we have, like the For fact sure. that you and I are able to do a Skype call um, yeah. across Canada and do like tomorrow we get to do whatever we want. Um, like yeah. just that unbelievable freedom. We have to do that. And like, we don't have to worry about our girlfriend or our brother or whatever being hurt or harmed or our own life being harmed is such an incredible thing. And I think that's mm -hmm. what's really important to think about on Remembrance Day is that, mm -hmm. um, and I think without knowing the, these personal stories, it's it's hard to wrap your head around it. So I think, yeah, I, I guess long story short is just an appreciation for the freedom we have and an appreciation for the veterans who sacrificed their lives to their youth so that we could we could have that freedom. For sure. Yeah, I know that's it's it's a really good takeaway because that's something that a lot of people take for granted. So 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes to your. Um, your film do you know when you're gonna have it released do you have an expected yeah. date yet so it's a little up in the air basically um it's going to be released next year for the 75th anniversary of the end of the war 20 okay because 2020 1945 yeah, sure. kind of a nice anniversary um a bit up in that's the, the perfect say, date yeah perfect date i say a bit up in the air because it doesn't currently have a distributor yet so i'm not sure when it will be released or where but i'm optimistic that i'll find one and i'm still mm -hmm. in the process of uh, raising money for that, whether it's through uh, GoFundMe or um, approaching organizations to see whether it's something they want to put their name on. Um, sure. That's still a work in progress. But uh, yeah, sometime next year and uh, ideally, well, like the dream, the the dream, but I don't know if it would ever happen, is I'd love for it to um, be released locally in a few of the cities that I visited and maybe have some of the veterans that I interviewed make an appearance and whether it's just an opportunity to meet meet a second world war veteran or maybe even get them on stage for a, a question and answer period i think that's, that's awesome. a pretty incredible way to kind of see the film but also have that personal connection to uh literally living history before it's uh before it's too late yeah that that is that would be incredible mm -hmm. i will do whatever i can to get the <laughs> word out there no because this is just like an incredible you know film that people need to see especially totally. our generation the generations after the war that never experienced it and 100 you know to keep those stories alive um no matter what generation it is like it's a very important thing mm -hmm. to see what these individuals went through you mm -hmm. know for our freedom so it's that's awesome um in terms of donating where can people donate to support you and your film yeah, you just go to my website, uh, ericbruntmedia.com, and there's a big Donate Now page that takes you to my GoFundMe. Okay, perfect. So I'll definitely link that stuff in the show notes. So if you're awesome. on, on, on the internet, definitely click that. Um, in terms of your film, when people finally go watch the entire film, mm -hmm. what do you want their takeaway to be? Yeah, I, um I think that's a good question. I, I think I want their takeaway to one be kind of what we were talking about before, like the um, 
the being proud to be Canadian and yeah. call these people Canadians and knowing that you yourself are a Canadian, um, know, having seen this personal face that you can now uh, think about when you, ha- you take those two minutes of silence at Remembrance Day. Hopefully now you'll have a number of faces that you can link that to. And yeah. uh, also I think maybe inspire an interest in your own family history and ask questions of your grandparents and maybe even your parents about their history that you might miss otherwise. Cause I know um, this project's made me think of so many questions. I wish I asked my grandfather. So sure. if you can do that with your own family history, like that'd be a, an amazing takeaway. I hope uh, people learn from it and maybe just to add another one, uh, the fact that sometimes you just got to, if you have a passion or an idea, sometimes you just got to go out and do it and, that's mm-hmm. the only way to get it done, and hopefully my documentary can be seen as a kind of that process of just having that dream and going for it and trying to do it the best you can and all the pieces lining up and you being able to uh, come out of it with a final product. So, yeah, I guess those those four things for sure. Awesome. I love it. I, I especially love that connecting with your grandparents. Like, that's a huge thing. Yeah. And I think it's something that a lot of people take for granted. I take for granted sometimes, too. Like, mm-hmm. just simply reaching out and having a conversation with your grandparents. Totally. It's just such a big thing. Like, it's just... And you can you learn know, so much about yourself by asking your grandpa or your grandma, like, what was life like when you were young? And just, like, hearing the similarities. It's crazy, the yeah. It's like, you'll, 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 there's, I guarantee you'll come out of it with more knowledge of who you are and what your family is like. For sure. Like even, for example, like my grandpa, you know, he never had to serve in the war because he was in Canada. He was, Mm -hmm. he's from Trinidad. So that's where he was living. Um, But, you know, he had to experience, you know, life during the war. So, you know, times were a lot tougher. You know, he had to drop out of elementary school Mm -hmm. to work for the family. Like that, things were different back then. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you don't, have to do that nowadays you, you know you get the opportunity to actually go to school mm-hmm. a lot of people go to college too like it's yeah so it's yeah like it's a those, really good yeah yeah hearing those stories of like your your own grandparents sacrifices and if if they're not around to tell their stories like your parents will know some that they they heard when they were growing up so um and even your parents at some degree might have had to do some sacrifices during their during their youth so those are always really important to learn and uh, to preserve in some way, whether it's your own thoughts or your or you write it down. For sure, awesome. Um, so to sort of wrap up the um the podcast, we're coming to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything uh in terms of books around mm-hmm. this topic or anything that sort of inspired you mm-hmm. throughout your life that you can recommend to people? A lot of times, people are looking for books to change their life, whether mm-hmm. it's like you know self I, I don't know self-help books or like even biographies mm-hmm. to learn something new um it doesn't have to be war related or anything like that is mm-hmm. there anything that you recommend to people to read yeah um i think like the it is it is war related but a book that mm-hmm. i really uh, appreciated that i read during my trip was a book by the name of um forgiveness by okay. uh, mark sakamoto and what that book is about is it's also written by from a a grandson of a veteran and basically uh this this man's uh his so let me get this straight so his mother's grandparents they were japanese canadians okay and they actually experienced the internment during the second world war oh, okay yeah so they were considered uh enemy uh enemy by canada so they, and stuff yeah 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 That's... so they had so they had to go uh go to rural alberta and live on a farm and uh kind of I had to experience like the, that 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 dark side of Canada's history, yeah. and on the flip side, his his dad's uh, I got it mixed up I think, but when what the other side, the grandparents, uh, his grandfather was a prisoner of war for Japan, so he was wow. he spent the war in I think it, it was like three or four years uh, in a prisoner of war camp in Japan, fighting for his life, kind of experiencing the same things I was telling you about that other the other veteran went through and Crazy, yeah. the book is about how this grandson is a product of both these sides and how both sides of these family are able to look at the history and look at who they are as people and their, the personal history they have with each other and forgive each other and uh, what they can learn about it. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's really powerful and just such a unique story that he has both those sides to his family history and 
um, yeah, I, I definitely would recommend it for a, a book about uh, stories you don't normally hear about the Canadian uh, involvement, but also um, just an amazing way that forgiveness can can help us. For sure, yeah, because that's that's a that's a really interesting topic. Like that's a crazy story um, mm-hmm. for his grandparents to be on both sides. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's something that you don't really hear about either. Is the, no. the Canadian soil um, part of it? Oh, totally. Um, that's, that's really cool. Um, so, so that's awesome. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to say before we wrap up the podcast? Um, and, and then we'll get into some promotion stuff. Um, uh, I think that I pretty much said all the messages that okay. I can think of. Uh, just if you're, maybe this links into what you're going to do next, but if you want to follow along on the adventure, uh, I post pretty regularly on my, uh, Facebook and Twitter, Instagram. It's just my, Perfect name eric brunt media and uh all the good stuff will be on those perfect and then your website is eric brunt media dot com dot com eric brunt media dot com perfect yeah, exactly. um and then people can donate through there and find mm-hmm. out more information um yeah. about the film perfect and, and here are some of these stories that i've been mentioning yeah awesome yeah and then you already have you know a few of them i saw on instagram and stuff yeah. like that. So. and youtube and yeah for sure yeah, so like definitely for, I would recommend to everybody that's listening, check these out, especially during the month of November, because it'll mm-hmm. give you some perspective. Um, and some personal faces to attach to those, uh, the Day of Remembrance. Yeah, yeah. Um, the last thing that I'm going to ask you mm-hmm. is, actually, I have two more things. <laughs> okay. Um, no the The first thing is, in terms of Remembrance Day, is there any like sort of tips where you would give people to sort of how they should spend Remembrance Day yeah. in the month of November? I Yeah, uh, I'd say for the month of November, uh, tr- try and learn a few uh, a few stories of veterans that you might not have known before, and especially mm-hmm. like those, uh, just like a personal story, like it can be maybe in the newspaper or maybe just looking up online, just mm-hmm. what, what one individual veteran went through. And then when it's the actual... Remember today, and you take those two, take try and take those two minutes. If you can't do it at eleven o'clock, then find another time. But uh, I would say take that story that you learned about and really picture yourself in that person's shoes and going through all those experiences that they went through and kind of questioning what would you do in those circumstances and um, why you're there because of what that person went through. I think is really important. Perfect. I love it. Um... And then the last thing is every week we have a question of the day. Mm -hmm. So this can be anything you want to ask the audience. Mm -hmm. Um, It can be about anything. Some people, you know, I I always give the recommendation, what's your favorite color, but um, (laughs) you can do anything. (laughs) Okay. Uh, My question of the day is uh, what's, what's your grandpa's story is finding out what your, what your granddad did and uh, what, yeah. What, what is his story? Where where does he come from? I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, no it worries. was great to talk to you. Great we will definitely to have too. to connect when you come to Toronto. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, and definitely do that for sure. That'd be awesome. Well, thanks so much for the time and uh, interest in what I've been doing. Yeah, no worries. We'll keep in touch. Canadian.